I've talked about a lot of things that used to terrify me as a child. Whether it was the Crypt Keeper, the unsettling monsters in a really bad movie that's really bad, <laughs> demonic Pokemon the worst. But there was one movie that always seemed to dominate the conversation for me. I've had to have mentioned it several times in my videos at this point. I used to have an entire video dedicated to it. I used to really have a problem with the Exorcist. Aside from the movie itself, it was the face. The makeup job with Linda Blair was phenomenal. Reagan was beat. Even the dummy they used for the head turn is the most genuine. Oh fuck, that still exists somewhere. If you really, you better tell me right now. If you really, you better tell me right now. So recently I've done a few things. I've watched behind the scenes and interviews for The Exorcist. I watched the Leap of Faith documentary, William Friedkin on The Exorcist, he's the director. And I watched The Exorcist itself. And I would say rewatch, but I honestly don't know if I've ever fully watched the movie. But alas, this is my closure with my childhood demon. I mean, I know I said that in the other video where I made the diss track. Dirty ass bitch. But that was just me pretending to have overcome. It was a farce. I secretly still shuddered at the thought of a foggy night in Georgetown. And speaking of Georgetown, I mean shuddered, can I just say, I am obnoxiously happy that Shudder is sponsoring this video. Shudder is a streaming service for everything horror and thriller. You remember that movie I reviewed? La Llorona? The good one? That movie was a Shudder exclusive. I've already been paying for Shudder. And on top of that, these guys had the, the balls, the Kajanis, <laughs> to release a Shudder original, Leap of Faith, William Friedkin on The Exorcist. It is a documentary on the embodiment of my childhood trauma, The Exorcist. I'm 20 minutes into that and I'm hooked. The only reason I stopped watching was to record this. Shudder is an easy $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. You can stream it on all of your favorite devices or better yet, just try Shudder free for 30 days at Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com and use promo code Mr. GG. That's 30 days free for you when you use code Mr. GG. You support me and the sponsor, everybody wins. And thank you Shudder for sponsoring this video. Now my first shocking discovery through my watches was that Father Marin was not actually this rickety old man. I think you'd be surprised to hear he was acting. Along with the great makeup department, Max von Sydow was closer to this portrayed age when he was the three-eyed raven on Game of Thrones around four decades later. He was only 43 when The Exorcist was released. The movie begins in northern Iraq, and this isn't Laguna Beach pretending to be northern Iraq, this is northern Iraq. This is a real dig that William Friedkin can just got permission to film amongst. Father Marin discovers a small statue of Pazuzu, a demon that will soon be very relevant and scarring. And there's some peculiar things that occur in this segment. Like for example, this clock randomly stops ticking. Which, I mean, you guys can assume what that means, right? No, nope. you can't. Cause according to William Friedkin, once again, the director, doesn't mean shit. No intended symbolism, no intended foreshadowing. So I'm going to pause. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's gonna be good. It's so funny to me that, pardon my French, a lunatic like Friedkin, who comes off very precise, also just did a bunch of stuff. Father Marin just kind of neanders around, catching some great shots. Not really relevant, but like I said, stuff. The boys pull up with the blickies, but they're like, oh, it's just Indiana Bones. Come on, Jeffrey. He then comes across the full-size statue of Pazuzu as two dogs fight to the death. At least that's what the sound effects would have you think. Cause to me, these puppers are just being cooty patoota bites. <laughs> you so big. I'll take five. By the way, I only now just realized that Pazuzu's got a fucking hog. <laughs> It's weird that they would immortalize him like this. It's almost as if it was at his request. Listen, I saw how Michelangelo did his boy David. Fuck all that. Pizu is a grower. Go ahead and sculpt that shit. Or do you not have enough materials? Now I would normally assume that I don't need to give a backstory here, but I'll sum it up regardless. Chris is the mother, Reagan is her daughter. They are a wealthy, happy family, and noises in the attic and sleeping troubles for Reagan start to slowly rear their ugly head. Separately, Father Karras wants out of priesthood as he is starting to lose his faith. He worries for his aging mother. Now then, I understand why the imagery in this movie was so unsettling to the unexpecting audiences in the 70s. It's fucked up too, because since the movie starts slow, you kind of get sucked in, 
And by the time you're in there, you're like, ah, oh, fuck. The movie starts to lube you up with the defiling of a Mother Teresa statue. And as someone who grew up in a religious household, I felt like I couldn't even look at something like that. I mean, even now, I don't want to show it to you on screen, even though I don't think it breaks any TOS. It then moves up to what I would consider to be a valid contender for the reigning childhood scar, Pazuzu. This is the demon that is slowly overtaking Reagan. And we see flashes of his face throughout the film, his first appearance being when Reagan is at the hospital. And I don't know what it is about Quan Chi that is so unsettling to me, because if you stare at it, which you might not want to, it's just white face, like fake hillbilly teeth, contacts, and a little splash around the eyes. You might see some doofus on Halloween dress up as Dracula and follow the same model, but it doesn't hit like Pazuzu. Why? Well, number one, I'm clearly oversimplifying the design here. I acknowledge that. But two, Pazuzu never comes to life in this form. He is a flash on screen. He is never overshown. He remains a demon in darkness. Reagan continues to act up. Father Karras' mother is taken into a mental asylum due to unfortunate circumstances and lack of funds, and she passes away. Father Karras, more like Father Careless. I mean, I've heard of deadbeat dads, but forgetful fathers, this is just ridiculous. Yeah. Reagan's hospital scene is interesting. The sounds in particular. I can't think of a movie that has so eloquently shown that the hospital sucks. You hear these buzzing, beaming lights, the blazing machinery. They take their time here, purposely. In fact, Friedkin believes some people's reactions to the movie spawned from the hospital scenes themselves. Fast forwarding, we arrive at an iconic moment that was actually not a part of the original release in 1973. It would only be shown in the 2000 re-release when they were able to hide the wires from her harness. And that is Reagan's spider walk when she boogies down the stairs and lets out a literal blood-curdling scream. There was two versions of this, the other one being Reagan spider walking into a nolly heel flip and becoming a serpent, which there's some debate as to which is the more powerful scene, but I prefer the blood because the serpent one can be kind of silly. <laughs> We're skipping ahead a wee bit, but a dead doctor is found at the bottom of the steps right outside of Chris and Reagan's place. And the detective thinks he was murdered by having his skull flipped around and then pushed out the window, with only Reagan being the one in that room. The quasi-interrogation scene that follows is actually Friedkin's favorite scene in the entire movie, and even I have newfound appreciation for the scene. I mean, I don't think I'd call it my favorite, but at the same time, it's kind of weird to carve out the favorite portion of your trauma. But if I had to shoot, I think my favorite scene would have to be the first exorcism scene session with Father Marin. We'll get there. Chris is at her boiling point with the doctors. They're not doing squat. They're like, yeah, I don't know. Her brain's crazy. Meanwhile, Reagan's using a crucifix like it's Johnny Sins. Oh wait, I actually shouldn't skip that part. Yet another iconic scene, a twofer. This scene's pretty out there. It still is. And Freakin didn't pull this scene out of thin air. This was in William Peter Blatty's novel, the Exorcist. And when Friedkin read it, he did not want to sugarcoat it. And he fucking didn't. Keep in mind, for the filming, Linda Blair is 12 years old, give or take. But she still had to say every line and do every action. To the point where she wasn't explicitly told what she was doing in this scene. She just knew she had a crucifix and she's stabbing the lower half of her body. So if you watch the behind the scenes, she's just stabbing a bloody box. Which obviously ended up being the point, but it's literally just like a DIY cushion. Eileen Dietz was also a double for some of these shots for those reasons. And she was also a double for other shots in the movie. You can keep an eye out for her. Eileen Dietz having the privilege of not only playing Reagan, but also Pazuzu. This ghoulish, snarling, sinister fiend is the lovely Eileen Dietz. And this shit, this fucking frame is just a frame from a makeup test. And Pazuzu now infiltrates the minds of millions. I don't want to sound like I'm not saying Freakin isn't talented or intelligent because he totally is. But when you hear the story of how the exorcist came to be, sometimes he just sounds like an accidental genius. I mean, I have so many things that I want to relay to you, but it makes sense for me to not make the video 90 minutes long and also for you to go watch the Leap of Faith documentary. Win-win, I don't know. <laughs> uh, let me finish the movie. In addition to the crucifetish, these are words in my script. Reagan does the unthinkable and surprises even Steven Seagal. What's wrong with you, man? You're slipping. But you can't check your six. Oh, shit! You know what she did? <laughs> your canting daughter! Bro. Cunting's an adjective? That's fire! Pazuzu got bars! Hey, you remember when I mentioned that this dummy shouldn't exist? Oh, nice gown. What kind of fabric is that? 
oven mitt? So just in case you haven't been keeping up, the great part about this movie and the trauma it's so beautifully spread is that you might not even have realized, but you might have been or still are afraid of up to four different characters. That being Linda Blair's Reagan, Eileen Dietz Reagan, Makeshift Reagan, and Pazuzu. Fuck this. So Father Karras comes to see Reagan, and at this point, she's past the point of no return. She's full-on fuckery, toying with him, perfectly imitating the voice of a beggar he refused to help near the beginning of the movie. Father, would you help an old altar boy? I'm a Catholic. Show me Reagan and I'll loosen one of the straps. Can you help an old altar boy, Father? telling him his mother is there with her. And Karis' smug rebuttals leave Reagan no choice but to have Father Karis get slime, baby! Remember when slime was like the gimmick of Nickelodeon? What a weird era. I'm guessing Dan Schneider was probably on the board and couldn't shy away from the idea of having teens covered in goop. Ain't that right, father? Fun fact, Reagan's puke is just pea soup. It also wasn't even supposed to hit James Miller's face. It was supposed to hit his shirt. James Miller didn't like that. And even though they retook the shots, this shot ended up being way fucking better. And I think now's a good time to talk about some of Friedkin's old school tactics on set. One being that Friedkin stayed strapped. He apparently had guns all over the set for the sole purpose of popping off a slug during filming to get the best genuine reaction from the actors. Even for something as small as a jolt from a telephone ring. James Miller also didn't like that. In addition, Ellen Burstyn gets yanked by a harness in this scene and she was starting to get worried that she's gonna get hurt. Freaking, this other lunatic is pulling me way too fucking hard. I, I, I could get hurt. So Friedkin assured Ellen that he would have it dialed back and as she turned around, Friedkin shared a look with the special effects guy and basically told them, give her hell. And that is why in this scene, you get such a good juicy scream from Ellen. <laughs> because that probably hurt. I'll tell you one more just because I really enjoyed this one. I know I'm spoiling you. There's a scene where a priest has to display some emotion over his fallen comrade and they took that shot over and over and over and it wasn't cutting it. Probably because the priest in the scene was an actual priest, he wasn't even an actor. So Friedkin comes over and says, hey, we need this shot. Priest says, yeah, for sure. Friedkin says, do you trust me? Priest says, yeah, of course. So Friedkin pulls back and slaps the hymns out of the priest, pushes him back into frame, and yells, action. And he gets the shot. It's a fun story that resulted in a great product. But I understand why people might side-eye Friedkin a little bit for some of the practices. Now, although Father Karras is against an exorcism, he is slowly convinced through more and more events. But Karras can't run this alone, so they reach out to Father Marin, and that's where we catch this legendary shot of Marin leaving the cab, which Friedkin put a lot of thought into. What an excellent day for an exorcism. The first exorcism scene is great. I'm just gonna say it. I actually really liked it. You guys might not understand, but it's so weird to say that I enjoy this movie in any type of way. For so long, I have refused and hated to watch footage or even look at a photo from the movie. My heart would legitimately jump when I would accidentally come across like an exorcist thumbnail on YouTube or some shit. But I genuinely like this scene. Mark Moncito gets busy on the mic. Dare I say, a biblically busy. Do not despise my command because you know me to be a sinner. It's God himself who commands you. Like that? <laughs> like that, Father Marin? Okay. The demon is letting loose all types of wild shit and obscenities. All the sounds coming from her, the chaos erupting in this actual freezing room. I can't not appreciate it, especially after learning so much about it. Reagan's demon voice, courtesy of Mercedes McCambridge. Friedkin discusses the crazy story to that in the doc. I mean, some of her lines were out here. Your mother sucks cocks in hell. What an absolute dagger of an insult. It's like a three-pronged insult. Your mother's dead. Also, father, she's in the fucking gallows. Also, she's doming up Stalin as we speak. Jeez. Moving on, Father Marin dies when he tries to exercise Reagan alone. We're not shown how, but Reagan, now untied, just calmly sits at the corner of the bed as Karis discovers his body, and she even lets out a giggle. <laughs> 
which drives Karis into a rage. He throws her to the ground, hell, even Tyson's her shit, and yells for the demon to come into him instead. And apparently, this last part can be interpreted in a few ways. Freakin' doesn't even sit on one side of it. But to me, Karis tries to sacrifice himself for Reagan's sake. The demon enters him, and it is not the demon who makes him jump out of the window, but Karis himself fights back in his final moments to ultimately destroy the body that the demon has overtaken and expel the demon. And there's questions that can spawn from that, like technicalities and shit. But I get the gist, I'm fine with this resolution. And I also enjoy the ending ending of the movie as well. Keep in mind, I'm watching the 2000 version, but I also wanna add something small that I like. Right after Karis jumps, the detective and Chris run into the room. Reagan is just Reagan at this point, terrified, not knowing what the fuck is happening, yelling for her mother. And Chris does not immediately go to her side. She's so hesitant. She's been through so much. She hasn't seen her daughter in I don't know how long. She's seen the trickery. She leaves her daughter crying in the corner until she just can't any longer. And they finally hug. So tiny of a detail, but so refreshing to see. You think of other movies where the demon leaves the body and the girl instantly looks up and she's like, Mom? And they just hug right away with a gleeful orchestra. No questions asked. That shit is trash compared to this. I know The Exorcist can be an awfully slow movie. And right now, the urge to rewatch it is very low, but I did enjoy my watch. I enjoyed learning more about the film. A lot of it was actually very impressive. I know there's plenty of things I didn't touch on, but like I said, I'd be here for an hour if I did do that. I could have talked about a lot of the rumors surrounding the set where it was bad luck because people were passing away. Friedkin talks about the pathway to discovering the Exorcist theme song, the infamous Exorcist theme song. Stanley Kubrick denied directing the film. Friedkin discusses a lot of the inspiration he had for points in the film, certain scenes. If you're interested, that's on you. But I feel comfortable where I stand right now in relation to The Exorcist. My childhood demon. I can't tell you how many times I just had a freeze frame of Pazuzu just enlarged on my monitor. And I was okay with that. I mean, it's still terrifying to look at, but it's a different feeling. Genuinely, I'm happy about it. Anyway. And that's the review, baby! If you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like. And here is your second reminder to please leave a like. Subscribe because I have more content coming your way. A shout out to my lovely, lovely, lovely patrons for always supporting the boy. Shout out to Darcy Jean for retweeting my last video tweet. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday on Twitch. That's been a lot of fun. Gonna continue uploading stuff on the Highlights channel. Mr. GG Live. I did a collab with the wonderful Leon Lush. You can check that over on his channel. This is random, but if you got any experience in making thumbnails, feel free to DM me on Twitter. I could always use the extra help. Also, this most likely will be the last video until next year. And that's because I will be in the moving process and frankly, I just won't have the time. But come January, the start of 2021, I should definitely have some good shit ready for you, which will include a movie review special, a continuation in a series that you guys seem to enjoy, hopefully a collaboration, all types of fun stuff brewing up in the pot, ladies and gentlemen. But as always, I am Mr. Gigi and I, I'm out. <laughs>